Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys here today. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 2 Chronicles. We'll be there in just a little bit. Uh, Happy New Year. Man, ready for a routine again. I don't know about you, but holidays are fantastic, but I'm ready for routine. I'm ready for kids to go back to school. Any parents ready for that? Uh, Praise Jesus. Uh, We're we're starting a new series today, and I'm really excited just about the direction that we're gonna take for the next four weeks as a church, and really excited about how God is gonna use this season and this time in the life of our church to do some pretty incredible things, I'm believing. And and, uh, let me me just take some time to kind of set up uh, where we're at and what we're doing. Uh, When I was growing up in the life of the church, uh, we had at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, uh, what we would call a revival. And uh, what a revival was at a church at that time was simply bringing in an evangelistic uh, type speaker. And uh, so a special speaker would come in and, and we would literally have church every night of the week. And back then people, people would come. And, and, um, and so it, it, was, it was really kind of geared towards inviting people who weren't connected to a church, who weren't believers, to come and experience this, this uh, preaching. And, and uh, we called it revival, you know? And, and, and so we saw a lot of people um, come to faith But when you look at the history of the church, when we come to this word revival or a spiritual awakening, the history of the church is something different than than what that was. Because a revival isn't something that you can say, hey, show up tomorrow night and we're all going to experience revival. Uh, Those of you that that come are going to experience a totally transformation of your heart. It it just doesn't work like that. Like a real, true spiritual uh, awakening cannot be planned. You can't strategize for it. You can't make it. It happen. It's really a unique, powerful moment where the Holy Spirit of God decides to show up and do something in power, right? And so, so when we look at the, the history of the church, God has sent various spiritual awakenings to the church. And so uh, I would go all the way back uh, to, on record, the, the, the 1600s, where the great Puritan revival of Great Britain uh, really well, was one of the first ones on record. And, and uh, two-thirds of Great Britain came to know Christ and were involved in church uh, as a result of that. A lot of um, you know, coming into the Americas was a result of people longing for that spiritual Um, uh, freedom. And so uh, out of that, God used it. We saw in the 1700s in the U.S. the first great awakening, men like Jonathan Edwards and and, uh, men men like him who, who were preaching and God's power and spirit just fell uh, upon uh, the northeast of America. In the 1800s, we see the second great awakening. So again, God using preaching and the church and and, uh, uh, an awakening happening in our country. On record, we've seen revivals taking place in Korea and and China and Africa. Right now, they, they are experiencing, I'm told, I read about this revival that's taking place underground in the country of China. And so so we hear about these things. It's a unique, powerful moment. And, and uh, for, for most of us here, we've never actually experienced it uh, because we've not seen one since. And so in America, we're kind of in that season of where we, you know, the 1800s, sure, Billy Graham came on the scene and we saw some pockets where, where evangelism and, and just a unique, powerful moment took place in our country in various places, but nothing like the first and second Great Awakening. And so, so what is a revival? I would, I, would, I would ask you to write that down and to think about it and ponder on this question over the next few weeks. And, and so as I start to explain it today and kind of set this up, let me just say what revival is not. Uh, Revival uh, is not just evangelism. When we talk about a spiritual awakening, it's not just people coming to know Jesus. Uh, It's part of it, but it's not the full story. It's not the full picture. When I was in student ministry, um, one of the events that that we held, uh, we we would gather students and have these big events and and things, and it 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 was a great time, but one in particular God used to really transform my ministry. We had over a thousand students in this one gathering and uh, we had a speaker come in and he preached and at the end of that, like 75 students came forward professing Christ as their Lord and, and uh, after that night and through the week, man, uh, the church was just uh, so encouraging to me and, and it was such just like one of those nights where like, man, we experienced revival. So many people came to know Christ. Uh, but then myself and my team, we started to contact and call these students back when students would answer the phone when you called them in. Um, and as we were talking to them, what we found out was that 98% of those students didn't want to be baptized. They didn't know what decision I was talking about. 
and we never saw them again in the life of our church. So God used that moment to kind of wake me up to say, you've got to do something different. It was one of those events that really impacted the, 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 the birth of this church and, and how we structure it and, and, and what we do here at our church because there's got to be a better way. Like spiritual awakening, revival, doesn't mean that, that people are raising their hands and saying they want to be saved. And so there's something deeper, there's something more that must take place. Uh, revival, secondly, is, is, is not about emotionalism. And the first and second great awakenings in America, people during the message, specifically, I'll just talk about Jonathan Edwards. He was saying he was preaching. And as he's preaching, in the middle, the spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit fell, and people started crying out literally to God, out loud, crying out to God for mercy and forgiveness. They were falling on their faces in the auditorium that he's preaching. And so in his writings, he's like, I was trying to preach. So I was telling him to be quiet. I was like, shh, I'm trying to preach here. And then he finally just kind of had to step back and let God's spirit just kind of, kind of flow in that moment. And, and out of that was birthed this awakening that just swept across the northeastern colonies and, 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 and cities. And, and so the, the idea, though, is during this time, yeah, it was emotional. People were crying. People were, were falling on their face, experiencing this power. Um, but then there were also some charismatic groups and some people that were kind of taking it to another level. And so there's a whole, you can, you can read about this. There was a whole group of people who thought the revival was coming when you would, when you would like hit a, a fit of barking like a dog. So literally, you know, they're in a service and people would be caught up in the spirit and they'd start barking like a dog. There's another whole group that it, it was, you know, evidence of the spirit in, in an awakening was when you, when you hit this fit of laughter. And so they'd start laughing. And so, so sure, criticism came against the awakenings because, okay, this is crazy, right? And, and yeah, there was, there was evidence of a real awakening. And then there was the barking and all the other crazy stuff that, that wasn't evidence of the spiritual uh, realm. And so Edwards was one of the first guys to write on revivals and and so in his writings he would talk about how do we know if it's a true awakening how do we know that people are really experiencing the power of God and so the bottom line for Edwards is that you can't tell that night you can't tell that week essentially you've got to wait and see does it produce a changed heart that was the that was the bottom line for Edwards a heart that loves and serves and worship Jesus that's the only way to truly no, a lot of people can raise their hand just because you cry today or get excited today doesn't mean you experience the Holy Spirit, you speak in whatever kind of language, doesn't mean you experience anything powerful from the Holy Spirit. The evidence of an awakening is a changed heart that leads you to worship and serve and be on mission with Jesus. So, so what is a revival? I would say at its core, to revive means to bring back to life. So to bring back to life is what revival means. So that means that a revival can only happen for those who actually already know Christ. So a believer in Jesus needs to be revived. Someone who does not know Jesus today doesn't need revival, they need vival. <laughs> they need life. They need the first bit of life transforming power of salvation from Christ. And so when we talk about an awakening, when we talk about revival, what we're talking about is the people of God people that know Christ, those who serve him and in a unique way, the spirit of God works. It's an extraordinary way. Now, God is always working. But when a revival takes place, our passion that maybe has been lost is restored or we experience it at a deeper level. No, God's extraordinary power, his, his spirit flows within us and, and gives us that passion and joy and conviction of sin and love for him like we've never experienced before. I love how John Piper defines a revival. He says this, revival is a sovereign work of God. So again, let's just pause. We can't create it. You, you can't do X, Y, and Z and God's gonna give you a revival and change your marriage and change everything. It, it happens, it's a sovereign work of God. He chooses, he decides when to unleash a, a, a powerful moment of transformation in our life. It's a sovereign work of God, and the purpose is to awaken people with a fresh intensity. So there's a fresh power and energy and focus. For what? Not for my own personal happiness or not for you know, anything particular for me. It's, it's for the truth and glory of God. That's how we know. Like there's a, there's a fresh passion for a truth 
and, and, and for a glory that we see in God. He awakens us to the ugliness of sin. So again, I can't make you recognize sin in your life. Only the Spirit can do that. I, I, I can't make myself understand the ugliness of the sin that is in my own heart. Only the Spirit of God can awaken my, my own senses to experience that. To the horror of hell. Again, yes, we need to share the love of Christ, but when the Holy Spirit awakens us to the horror of hell, then all of a sudden, Facebook does not matter. All of a sudden, that person that doesn't know Christ needs my attention and needs my prayer and needs my love because it's a reality. He awakens us to the preciousness of Christ's atoning work. So the atoning work, taking our place on the cross, there's a fresh, like, like preciousness to that and love for that and understanding of that. It brings back this wonder of our salvation by grace through faith. Like, how could he save me? How, how is it possible? There's this awakening in love and just kind of realization that, oh my gosh, this is what he's given me. I don't deserve it. There's an urgency to live with holiness and an urgency to witness to those who don't know Christ. And then there's the sweetness of worship with God's people. Like, I want you to sing. I want you to mean what you sing. I want to mean what I sing. I want to sing as loud as I can. I want to make a joyful noise. It's not always on pitch. So I, I, I claim that promise. A joyful noise is what he desires, right? I want us to do that. I want us to experience that. But sometimes the only way we get there is, is through an awakening, a revival. See, it can't be manufactured. We can't make this up. We can't force this. But when we look at history, there are some common characteristics that are at play in the life of the church that we can look at as a model for us, that we can look at to see, okay, let's just kind of get, get the landscape, the, the, kind of the lay of the land that's taken place in the life of the church. And so the, the common characteristics are this. The first thing that we see is that people, the people of God make and made prayer a priority. So prayer was a sincere part of, of, of all of these awakenings. It was a prayer that God would send a revival, that God would send an awakening. It was a prayer that they would, they would seek him and run after him. They would hold these prayer meetings that would last for hours Right, and so some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, we, he's gonna make us come for six hours this week, isn't he? No, it wasn't something that they planned. It wasn't something that they scheduled. It was something they gathered and the Holy Spirit just took them there. I, don't, I would imagine they didn't even know how long it was. Like, well, man, we've been here for five hours. Some, some of them lasted that long. We've been praying for this long. It, it, it's gone by like that. It's gone by in a second. Why? Because there was a priority of prayer. And it wasn't just in their prayer meetings in groups. It was in small groups. They, they were meeting throughout the week. They were discussing what they were hearing. They were, they were praying about what they wanted to experience and what God was doing. And so it was an everyday experience, not just in the room on Sundays, but all throughout the week, all over the city. So I believe it is a good thing and it is a right thing for us as a church to pray for revival. I think it's something we need to do, we should do. We should long for that and ask God for that. The second characteristic we see is that the people of God rediscovered the power of the gospel. So they rediscovered this through the preaching and teaching of God's word. They rediscovered this by looking at the word of God themselves. There was a hunger, there was a desire to know God's word, to feed on the word of God, to experience the word of God. And so, yeah, they would have services where multiple uh, preachers would, would preach and then they would, they would leave and, and, and they would look at it themselves and they would talk about it themselves. Again, just like prayer, it was an ongoing Bible study, it was an ongoing hunger because they were learning and they were experiencing for the first time some deep truths, some, some powerful truths that were actually transforming their heart, right? The, the next thing that we often see is that the people of God creatively communicated the gospel to the community. So as they are experiencing this awakening, the result of this led them to invest in others, adding value to other people. And so that's the thing, if you truly experience a revival, it's gonna lead you to share the gospel, it's gonna lead you to love people, it's gonna move you into action for the kingdom of God. He doesn't just give us this awakening so that we can feel warm and fuzzy. No, he is sending us on a mission. It's a joy for us to do that. 
in the early 1800s as a result of some of these awakenings that were happening, there was a group of young men. Um, they were, there, were, there was only five of them. And they gathered in a, a field. And they gathered there to, to pray. It was a simple time for them to pray. And they began to talk about, okay, if hell is a reality, how are the people in the world who have never heard about Jesus going to come to faith? How are they going to experience the power of the gospel? How are they gonna experience heaven? And so they're praying, God, show us. And in the middle of that meeting, a, a, a really bad thunderstorm came over the field. And in this thunderstorm, they run undercover under this haystack. And, 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 and as they are hiding under this haystack, they continue to pray and ask God. And, and as the storm passed away, it began to hit them. A moment, a, a glimpse of creativity came to their minds and their hearts and they said, why don't we create some kind of organization that will train people, that will send people, that will financially be able to support people to then travel to the ends of the earth and take the gospel. And out of this one prayer meeting, they call it the Haystack Prayer. And out of this one prayer meeting, the first missionary sending organization was birthed. So out of revival, out of awakening, out of prayer comes creativity to do something that has never been done before. What is it that has never been done before that Foothills Church, that you specifically need to create or to do? And, and, and the only way that that's gonna happen is if the Holy Spirit of God just, boom, just kind of gives you that glimpse, that moment of creativity. He awakens you to what it is that we need to do in a country where we're trying to reach a group of people that do not wanna be reached. A secular, individualist society that says, you have your truth, I have my truth, don't bother me. How do we take the gospel to them? Well, we seek and we ask and we wait for God. See, the effects of revival in American history led to thousands of salvations, yes. Led to thousands of people called into ministry. It led to thousands of churches being planted. It always led to social reforms as well. Reforms like the, the child labor laws that were changed as a result of a, a, a revival. Uh, the abolition of slavery began to take place, especially in those early days in Great Britain and then onward into the US because of revival. There was a decrease in crime always. There were improvements in the institution of marriage and in the family structure as a result of these revivals. We've seen colleges, seminaries created as a result, churches planted, the list of things that are positive are endless. Colleges like Princeton and Rutgers and Brown and Dartmouth, all of these universities created for the purpose of training ministers to preach the gospel and start churches. So the essence in this series is not, okay, we're gonna create a revival and we're gonna do step one and step two and then we're gonna wait for God to send us revival. No, the essence of this series pre-vival is do you even want it? Do you even want it? And if the desire is actually there, then the only thing we can really do is prepare ourselves. And so that's where we get the idea of pre-vival, that we are preparing ourselves for an awakening that is to come. And I thought starting off the new year, 2020, a new decade, that we would prepare for a movement at God, that we would expect this, that we would long for it, that we would pray for it. And listen, I just believe God wants to do something new. I just believe God wants to do something powerful in your life and in this community. Now, God could save all of Asia today with the snap of his fingers if he wants to, but he just doesn't work that way. Just like we, we shouldn't expect to walk outside and cheeseburgers to fall from the sky to feed us lunch. Like he expects you to get a job, make an income, and, and, and go buy your own cheeseburger. That's, that's what he expects us to do. And so when we come to this idea of preparing, we, we, we can't do anything to manufacture it, but certainly as a church, we can pursue Jesus like never before. We can worship him. We can pray and seek his face. We can serve the church. We can live on mission. And as we do, we pray for revival and we expect him to move. I love how Charles Spurgeon really kind of tackled some of these concepts when he said this, what can a hammer do without the hand that grasps it? And what can we do without the spirit of God? So the idea is that you and I are the hammer. When you think about 
someone, a, a blacksmith who is forging a piece of metal. He takes this piece of metal, he puts it in the forge, it, it lights up, the flames heat up this piece of metal, and then he sets it on the anvil. And nothing happens in particular to that metal just because it's hot. What takes shape and what is created is when the blacksmith picks up the hammer and swings that hammer into motion and uses that tool in order to shape a knife, a sword, a piece of artwork, whatever it is he wants to shape. So it is with God's church. I am a useless hammer unless the Holy Spirit of God picks me up and swings me into motion. We as a church are useless, we're pathetic unless the Holy Spirit of God would pick us up and swing us for the glory of God that men and women would come to know Christ and be transformed in their marriage and transformed in this city. Man, that's what I long for. That's what I hope for. That's what I believe God wants to do in our life. Oh, that we would pray that God would pick us up and move us into action. So how do we prepare? How do we get there? Well, I wanna read probably a familiar text of scripture. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter seven. You can turn there. We're gonna look at two verses and I wanna unpack it today as we get going. God says this, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. You probably heard this passage before and what I want us to do is always be careful when we come to an Old Testament passage. We don't interpret it uh, in light of Old Testament principles, we interpret it in light of the cross. And so we live in the, in, the, in the age of the resurrection. So Jesus has come, he's fulfilled the old covenant. So how do we look at this passage? I wanna tell you that it is not a recipe for revival in, in the land of America, all right? Let's make sure we understand that it's not that. It is a specific promise given to Solomon for the people of Israel. The land that he is talking about is not America. Okay, God is not an American, okay? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Like God is in his own kingdom. We do not live for the land of America or the American dream. We are living for and prioritizing the land that is to come. It is the kingdom of God where you and I as believers in Jesus will live and reign forever. So this is not a promise that if we do X, Y, and Z that God's gonna send revival in America. What God is telling the people of Israel specifically to Solomon at this time is that if you continue to live this way, the plagues that he mentions earlier in this chapter are going to take place. One of them is a drought. You're gonna experience a drought if you continue to live this way. And the warning is that if you don't, the drought's gonna be here, other plagues. But if you humble yourself, if you seek my face, if you turn from your wicked ways, then I'm gonna heal the land. In other words, I'm gonna send rain, which for an agricultural uh, society, they had to have it. They had to have it. And so that's the idea, that's the point. But the warning is given to the Israelites. So how do we apply it today? Because Jesus Christ has already, as believers, he's already healed me. He's already forgiven me. But I do believe we can look at this and we can say, okay, okay. What do, we, what do we take from this and glean from this as a warning and instruction for our personal lives as we seek the face of God today? I think we can still apply some things. The first thing that we would apply is that he says, I want, he says, those who are called by my name. So as we think about this, those who claim the name of Jesus, the warning and the instruction is for us to adhere. Right? So, so again, revival and awakening takes place when the people of God are spiritually Revived, all right? So if you're taking notes, the first thing that he tells us to do here is to humble themselves. Humble yourself. Humble yourself, right? We see this all over the New Testament. Humble yourself. In fact, Paul says in Philippians chapter two, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Whew. That's hard to do. We're called to a life of humility. 
If you're looking for a new book in 2020 and you've never read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, it is a must read for every Christian in the room. Go grab it today, buy it, start with it this year. In the book, he talks about what true gospel humility begins to look like. And he says, you'll know it. You'll you'll know you have been with a truly gospel-centered, humble person when they are actually truly interested in you. (laughs) Interested in you. They're thinking about you. And, 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 and the, re- the reality is, humility isn't this idea that, that we would uh, think more of myself or that I would think less of myself, like I'm an idiot, I'm a terrible person. No, 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 no. The essence for um, Lewis here is that humility is simply just thinking of myself less. Right? I just stop concerning my thoughts with me and what I need with me and what I expect, me and what I think I need. We live in such a self-centered society and culture. It's just part of our DNA almost as a culture. Social media just fuels that, that desire and need for, for pride and ego in our life. Like me, comment on, on me, look at me, uh, affirm me. It's a desperate cry for desperate ego-driven people. And that's me, that's you, that's who we are. The reality is we are very prideful as a people. We're very self-reliant, not as dependent on God as he would call us to be. So humility is is not needing to think about myself. Grasp that that, that, that concept today. Humility means that you don't need to think about yourself. It's not needing to connect things um, to myself. It, it, it's an end to the thought that says, are they looking at me? Do they know me? Are they gonna talk to me? Is this event gonna be organized and orchestrated in such a way that it's gonna make me happy? It's thinking about you less. And as you do that, you begin to experience what Lewis calls the art and the experience and the freedom of self-forgetfulness. And the freedom of self-forgetfulness is being able to walk in a room and not think about yourself and not think about me, me, me and how this affects me and, and, and what this is gonna be for me and how people are gonna be blessed by me and, and are people gonna like me and, and we go into the room and we're actually focused on adding value to other people's lives. So that's the difference when we can walk away in the freedom of self-forgetfulness. It doesn't mean we have a low self-esteem and we, we, we think well, we're terrible people. It just simply means that we stop thinking about ourselves. Pride says, I'm here. Pride says, ego says, how's this gonna benefit me? Who's looking at me? You know, he's talking to me today, so he must have been thinking about me when he wrote this. Right, that's what ego does. It, it, it makes us think that everything is for me and about me and to me. And Jesus says, I want you to embrace humility. It'll change your life. It'll refocus your thoughts. You see, pride is the illusion that we're in control. And when we think that we're in control, the discipline of prayer in our life becomes extinct. Why? Because we treat God like, God, we got this. I'll let you know when I need you. We don't need your help. We don't need anybody in the church, right? We never ask for help. Why don't we ask for help? We don't ask for help from God. We don't ask for help in God's church. People that we say we're friends with, why? Pride, ego. If I tell them I need help, then they're gonna know I need help. (laughs) And that's just too much for our shallow little ego, isn't it? To actually think that we need help. Well, here's a news flash for you. You need help. And in fact, elbow the person next to you and just tell them, say, you need help. And if it's your spouse, be gentle. Don't, don't poke too hard. We need help. Everybody in here needs help. We need God's church. We need God's people. If you allow pride to reign and, and, and rule your heart, this miserable feeling will continue to follow you in 2020. Humility is the attitude that says, I can't do anything of value without God. I need God every step of the way. I need God every second of the day. 
it results in a prayer life, it results in, in service and of worship to God because it's the attitude that I need him every second of the hour. It's a recognition of our sin and, and spiritual emptiness without him. What would your life, your life look like in 2020 if you started to pursue humility in your life? That's the first thing he calls us to. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. Here's the second thing that he calls us to do. He calls us to pray and seek his face. Pray, pray and seek his face. So there is a passion and energy and a discipline to pray and to seek the face of God with an expectant heart that he's gonna answer, that he's gonna do something new, that he's gonna change, that I'm gonna learn something new. It's gonna impact me and I'm gonna be able to add value to other people's life. That's an expecting heart. Now the good thing about preaching on prayer is that everybody in the room needs to do better. So I know we're a captive audience. Like we need to do better, I need to do better. The bad thing about preaching on prayer is that we, we, we teach either out of a motivation of guilt we, we feel so guilty easily when it comes to prayer. Like, we need to pray. Oh, I know, I need to pray. I'm just a loser. I don't do it enough. Because right? we all kind of tend to go there out of guilt. But what I want to do is move us into a, into a motivation of, of love and, and a motivation of grace and of opportunity. And, and so that's hard to balance uh, as a pastor. But uh, I know when we preach on prayer, oftentimes, you know, we'll leave the room and we go eat lunch. And maybe you're the dad that's done this and you want everybody to know around the table that you were listening to Pastor Trent. And so the food comes, you're like, oh, let's bow in prayer. It's like you don't normally pray, so everybody's like, oh, what is this? And let's hold hands. And now it's like, oh my gosh, dad's holding hands. And then you go into this like 20 minute prayer where you're praying for your kids and your wife and all the people in Asia that need Jesus. And your kids are like, dad, I'm hungry. You know, in this prayer, right? So so the reality is, and, and, and what we need to do is, is, is have this, this, this kind of reality. Okay, we know we need to do it more. How do we motivate ourselves? And, and how do we move into a way that we discipline ourselves to actually talk to God? Because when we talk to God and listen to God, powerful things happen. Um, and, and it means, if we're gonna move in this direction, that we're gonna have to overcome some obstacles. And some of those obstacles, first of all, would be discipline. For some of you, you're just undisciplined and, and just like you're so busy and, and, and you're so task driven that you wake up and you go and you go and you go. There's a book I would recommend that says too busy not to pray. It's a great book because it kind of gets behind the, the mentality that we're all so busy. Uh, but yeah, that's true. But, but because we're busy, like that just means we need prayer all the more. And uh, how, how do we marry that? But for you and I, like we, we, we get to this point, we get into this rhythm where but we're just undisciplined and we're gonna have to overcome some of that uh, obstacle. Well, some of us feel like we're just bothering God when we pray. <laughs> like you're, you're like, sincerely, you don't pray because ah, I just don't wanna bother God with that. I can't tell you, there, there are a lot of good old country boys. I talk to you guys all the time, I love you, I'm one of you. But when I talk to you guys about prayer, oftentimes like, yeah, everything's going all right, so I don't really need to bother God with you know, this other stuff. And, Maybe you were raised with a dad who, when you talked to him, you felt like you were bothering him. And so you, you didn't like go to him and talk to him that much. And, 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 the, and what we do oftentimes is, is sometimes our experience with our earthly father transitions into our mentality of our heavenly father. And so we can treat them the same way. Listen, you're not bothering God by talking to him. And, and in fact, he tells us to do so. Some of us have all of our material needs met. And so we think we don't need prayer. You know, we don't, we don't, nothing's wrong, so I don't need prayer. And, and I would say, is that really what prayer is in the Bible? Like, w w when someone's sick, oh, now all of a sudden I need to pray and I need to ask for prayer? Isn't there something deeper there? I think there is. Over the next couple of weeks, we wanna begin to unpack that. I wanna talk about it more, but let me just say today that prayer is expected. And the life of a believer, Jesus says in Matthew 6, and when you pray, giving us the idea that you need to do this. Later in Matthew 6, he says, this is how you should pray. So he essentially says, hey, look, this is how to do it. So we're gonna talk about that. He says later in Luke 11, so I I'm telling you to ask, seek, and knock. So he's telling us to, to come to him, ask, and knock, and, and seek him. And he tells us in Luke 18, he tells the disciples that they should always pray. In Colossians 4, it tells us to devote ourselves to prayer. Like I could go on and on and on. It's all the way through the New Testament. So we're expected to do this. And then the second thing I would say is that prayer is a learned habit. It's a learned habit. 
And so when you first come to know Jesus, you don't know how to pray, right? It just, you just don't know how to do it. So you've gotta learn how to actually begin to incorporate this. It's okay to start your Christian life out with not knowing how to pray. If I, if I brought some of you up here, even though you've been a believer for many, many years, if I brought you up here on stage and I would just, hey, get close this out in prayer, you'd, you'd probably pee yourself right here in front of all these people. <laughs> you don't know what to say. Like, I don't know. Well, listen, if you're a new believer, n- no hard feelings. But at some point, knowing that you're, you don't know how is, is now actually sin in your life because you're not taking the responsibility upon yourself to actually learn. So that's how God makes us aware of sin, right? I don't need any prayer. I, I'm not a wicked person. I'm not a bad person, but um, oh, I haven't learned how to pray and I've been in the church for the last 10 years. Oh, sin, right? So he calls us to learn how to do this. And so how do we learn how to pray? A couple of ways. First of all, we learn how to pray by actually praying, If you're gonna play basketball, you've gotta actually pick up the ball and start dribbling. Learn how to shoot, you've gotta actually do it, right? And so that's simply one step. Another step is we learn how to pray uh, by praying with other people. And so when we pray with other people, we learn how to do this. And those that have been learning this and, and, and doing this for a long time, we glean from them, we grow from them. One of the things that we wanna do as a result of this series, and we just wanna dedicate this time to God and we wanna do something different. So we were thinking about how we could do this and, and we thought, you know what, let's, let's, let's do this on Wednesday nights at 6.30. We're gonna gather in this room starting this Wednesday and we're gonna have a prayer meeting. And this prayer meeting is actually gonna be a meeting where we actually pray. And it's gonna last an hour and it's gonna fly by and I want you to bring your prayer requests. We're gonna pray for them. We're gonna sing some songs. I'm gonna talk for a little bit and it's going to be an absolute shot in your arm every single week for the next four weeks. We're gonna pursue Jesus together. We're gonna praise Jesus together. We're gonna ask him to open up the heavens of God to flood in this place together and I believe God is going to do incredible things. And so that's the next four weeks. Wednesday nights at 6.30. Students are gonna continue to do their programming. So you drop, if you've got students, drop them off and come on in. And if you've got little kids, there's no childcare, we don't have the facilities to actually take care of the kids. And so I felt like early in the first service, like I needed a video of the 2020 vision. If you wanna give to the vision offering, like, because I would love to be able to do that. We just don't have the facilities to actually accomplish that. Now that was actually a joke, but I don't think you got it. Um, <laughs> I don't want to show a video. Um, So that's this week. We're going to talk more about prayer over the next couple of weeks, and so I hope you'll be here. Here, Here's the third thing the scripture is telling us here today. He says, turn from their wicked ways. So the idea here is that we would repent of our sin. Now, a lot of people in the room, we can admit things aren't perfect, right? If I were to say, hey, do you have a perfect marriage? You feel like you're walking perfectly with the Lord. No, things aren't perfect. But we have a really hard time repenting of sin. Repenting of sin means that there's a change in your mind, there's a change of direction, and it leads to a change in your behavior. So it's this idea that I'm changing my mind, the Holy Spirit of God is changing me, and I'm severing whatever is in my life that is contributing to that sin. So if I'm in a sinful relationship, I don't just feel bad about it and continue in that relationship. True repentance means I cut that relationship off. I sever it. I turn away from it, walk away from it. If you can't stop getting drunk, then it's not I gotta do better, I feel bad. No, it's a severing of alcohol in your life. I I am, I am removing it, I'm throwing it away, I'm pouring it out, I'm going to seek help, I'm doing whatever is necessary to sever that sin in my life that is wreaking havoc on every area of my spiritual life. If you're looking at pornography, it's not just telling God you're gonna do better or try harder. Repentance means you delete the apps, you get rid of your phone, you get rid of your computer. Jesus says, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. What was he saying? Sin is killing you. Sin will ruin you. John Owen, great preacher of old, said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. God is not calling you to sever these things so that you can just have a better self-esteem. No, he's telling you this so that you would experience freedom, 
so that you would experience joy. When someone's caught in sin, oftentimes there's this embarrassment, you know? There's this, oh man, I'm, I, I was caught, and so yeah, I desire forgiveness, but true repentance, even if you're caught, would require you to change your behavior. It, it, it would truly be a removal of that sin in your life and walking in another direction. It doesn't mean perfection. It means that you are removing and walking. So what sin do you need to lay down today? What do you need to sever? What do you need to cut out? What do you need to turn from? Perhaps in this series, God will show you. Perhaps in this series, God will speak to you. Now, if we do this, if we turn from our wicked ways, if we pray and seek the face of God, here's what he tells us. He says, I'm gonna hear you. And we already know this from the New Testament. We know that God hears us. He hears our prayers. I will hear you. I will forgive you. And I will heal you. So again, in Christ, when you pray, he hears you. If you seek repentance today, turn from sin, receive Jesus into your life, he will forgive you of your sins. He will save you. He will heal you spiritually. And as we walk with him as a follower of Christ, we will continue to experience moments of healing in our life as we continue to lay down sin in our life and walk with Jesus. That's what walking with him looks like. It's a continual repentance. It's a recognition of sin and a laying it down and a picking up and worshiping of him. If you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek the face of God, if you turn repentant from sin, you see, you'll get God's attention. He says, my eyes will be on you. My ears will be attentive to you. Yes, he listens to us. Yes, he's working all the time. But when these practices are happening in our life, there is a unique attention that I think that the Holy Spirit of God, he just kind of perks up the ears. Huh, what's going on? I'm gonna look, I'm gonna dive in, I'm right here, I'm zoning in on what are these people saying and doing, something is happening. We don't, in his sovereignty, we don't force him. We can't, you know, tempt him or make this happen. He just does it. And we do what only we can do, which is run after him. See, I believe with all of my heart, that God wants to do more in Blunt County. Would anybody agree with me on that? Just say amen. Yeah. God wants to do more in this county. He wants to do more in your marriage. He wants to do more in this city, at your school, in your office. He wants to do right here in my heart something new. He wants to revive Trent Stewart. He wants to revive you right now in the seat that you sit. And I just believe that if we run after him this year, together, corporately, I just believe he's gonna hear us. He's gonna radically change us. He's gonna do something unique, something that we desire, we didn't even know we needed it. And he's gonna provide it for us. He's gonna show it to us. What would it look like if you learned a new truth this year that totally changed everything? What would it look like in your life if, the, if, if you experienced the presence and power of God in your life like you've never felt it before? What if that question that you've been asking God for years was finally answered? Psalm 85, six says, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? God wants to do something new in your life. I believe it can happen. What we wanna do is pursue him. We wanna worship him. We wanna serve him. This is what we're called to do. We just, we continue to do what we know we're supposed to do. And as we do it, we expect him to give us more of him. And so to help us get there, we've created a 21 day prayer guide and and devotion for you. You can get it on our app. You can go online and download it. It starts tomorrow. No matter what you're doing for your private devotion, I hope you add this to your plate because I think there's just power We do this every January. There's just power when the people of God are reading the same things, praying the same things, devoted to the same things. I I just believe God's gonna do it. Wednesday nights, we're gonna have our our, our prayer worship meetings. I believe God's gonna use that. God's gonna transform us in and through that. And over the next three weeks, we're gonna continue to dive into what it looks like to experience pre-vival, prepare for a movement of God. And so here's how we close today. Here's what I wanna ask you to pray. If you're willing, would you, would you take a minute today as we 
pray and as we, we sing this song. By the way, this song we wrote because it's a prayer. It's a prayer that we want revival. I hope we can sing it with authenticity. Like that's what our, our desire. And if so, during this time, let, let, let's take a moment to ask God to awaken me to the true condition of my heart. That's a bold, dangerous prayer right there. God, awaken me, not my friend, not my wife, awaken me to the true spiritual condition of my heart. God, secondly, awaken me to the spiritual emergencies around me. Because if you're like me, tomorrow morning, your day is gonna start, you're back on your schedule, praise Jesus, the kids are back in school, and emergencies are gonna come your way. And it's gonna be the emergency that says, oh, you gotta take a picture and post this. Don't bother me, I gotta, I gotta come up with a perfect caption. But as God awakens us to the spiritual emergencies around us, we realize, oh my gosh, the person I sit next to every day at school, every day at work, they don't know Jesus. And in 2020, their life is gonna end. Like that's a spiritual emergency. Like you, me, we, we have some work, we have some love, we have a message to share. There are spiritual emergencies in our life. God, awaken us to that kind of thing. Awaken me to that. Let's pray together. Lord, we seek your face today. We turn from sin. Make us aware of the condition of our heart. Make us aware of the spiritual emergencies that are all around us, God. We declare that we want more from you. We need more from you. We lay down our pride, our ego. We humble ourselves before you today. We seek your face as we turn sin revival, God. Send a spiritual awakening into this place. Let it start with my heart. Let it start with every person in this room for your glory, for your kingdom. And we sing this with passion today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.